Okay, what do you think of when you think of the Feast of Trumpets? Many of us have gone through this day for many years, 10, 20, 30, 50 years, some. What do you think of? Well, we heard a little message with a song, the scripture that was read by the song leader. We look forward to Christ's return. We look forward to the resurrection, the first resurrection. But we also should remember something else. You probably may be thinking of this already. The horrific events that are going to strike this world. And make no mistake, although we thought it may have come 30, 40 years ago, we're closer now than we've ever been to the time when Jesus Christ will intervene in world affairs. We may be thinking of the seven seals that Christ will unravel one at a time. And out of those first four will come the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they become popular to know, to know. When I was working in Pasadena TV studios, we produced horses that were galloping. And I guess sometimes you can even still find those online. But they are going to reap havoc. They'll build in crescendo into massive destruction and end time events. Then there's the seven trumpet plagues that come after that. And the last plagues, the seven last plagues, the more bowls of God's wrath. When you put it all together, it's a pretty horrific story, a pretty horrific time, something the world has never experienced any time in the past, nor ever will again. So humanity's in for some awesome things. Just to touch on this, to touch, and this little sermonette, just two events alone, and all of that I just mentioned, will destroy one half of the world's population. Just two of those events. The fourth seal will take out a quarter of mankind, and the sixth trumpet plague will kill a third. You put those together, that makes half the population. The current population is estimated to be about 7.5 billion. 7.5 billion. It's a pretty large number, but the UN, uh, so the UN has uh, calculated by the year of 2056, there'll be 10 billion people on Earth. So how much is half that 7.5? That's about 3.75 billion people with a B. Hard to get your mind wrapped around that. Half the world's population destroyed in just two of those events and much more to follow before and after those events. So knowing all this as we do, understanding the horrific time ahead for humankind, how should we be motivated now? What should that do to us? What does it mean to us personally right here right now, sitting here in Bellevue during services. How should it affect us? Now some say, well, I'm stirred with, you know, stirred with fear, I'm in trembling, and, and I'm worried about what's gonna happen, and remember the 60s and the 70s, if you're around that time, that there was a massive influx of new people coming into the church. They were afraid, because we thought for sure it was gonna come any, any decade, 1975 in Prophecy was a horrific booklet you could read and see the people starving to death and bombs exploding, and the prophecy was enough to scare you into the church. And some people were motivated by fear. Should that be the ultimate motivation of why we're here and why we're learning now? We'll talk about that more in a minute. So we see that massive destruction is going to come, but if you look at those that came in the mid-60s and 70s, once they realize, oh, it's not going to happen as soon as I thought. Time's going to go on a little longer. Many of them began to drift away. Fear alone is not necessarily long-lasting as a motivator. It may drive us into the church to begin with, but it's not the ultimate thing that we should be stirred to action to do. We should be stirred to action for a couple other reasons. How about this? Maybe we just think it's about time this world woke up and get its just reward for how it's living. It's about time. Let's take revenge on these evil people. Those who destroy the world are going to be destroyed. Maybe that's our motive. Is that our motive? You know, Amos clearly says, do we desire the day of the Lord? Amos says, woe to those who desire the day of the Lord. It's a time of darkness and not light. That shouldn't be our motivation. Finally, people getting their just due. What about stirred to action and caring for people that are in this world? who are blinded, who have to live in this troubled world and live by its rules and its leader, Satan the devil. We should feel deep love and care for them. But the main point, the one point of today's message is, most importantly, if we want to survive these events, we need to draw closer to God in a deeper, closer, awe-respecting relationship. Because he will bring these things to pass. Make no mistake. It may seem longer than we'd like, but God's timetable is exactly on time. You look at Jesus Christ's life. 
He started out and he told his mother, it's not my time, I can't turn this water into wine. I haven't even begun my ministry yet. And then midway through, he said it wasn't his time, he couldn't bring too much attention to himself because he had more work to do. And the day before he was to be crucified, he knew it. He was exactly on time and gave his life for us. The end time events are gonna be the same way, exactly on God's timetable, not necessarily ours. And there's gonna be some horrific events. The time in the end is gonna be universal judgment. That's right, I said universal judgment. The question is how are you going to be judged? Worthy to escape all these things? There is a way of escaping, or are we gonna be judged right along with the rest of the world and have to go through some or all of that tribulation time? We should be motivated to draw closer to God now, as we'll see here in a minute. So what is this event, this Feast of Trumpets? Well, the, the Jews call it Rosh Hashanah. What does Rosh Hashanah mean? It literally means the head of the year in Hebrew. So it's the beginning of the year as they see it. And there was an interesting email I got from the Temple Institute just, yet, an ample Temple Institute just yesterday. And it was called a, a Good Year Ahead for All. It says this about Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the day that we recognize the sovereignty of God. These end times events should drive us closer to God because of his sovereignty, his ability to, to bring them about, and they will come right on time. The sovereignty of God, the king and creator of the universe, the judge of all mankind. You're going to be judged, brethren. We all are. Which side of the lightning are we going to be on when it flashes and these end time events begin to roll out one by one like trip hampers, one after another after another on an evil dying world? Where are we? It goes on to say, the day on which all beings pass before him like tender sheep. Rosh Hashanah's message is truly universal. It is incumbent upon all mankind to accept upon ourselves God's sovereignty and to take account of our thoughts and our actions. Well, wait a minute, don't we do that during the spring holy days, getting ready for the Passover? There's no reason we shouldn't be doing it now, getting closer relationship with God. The Jews often focus on their, their thoughts and their actions this time of year in light of the awesome sovereignty and recognition of God. Christ is sovereign over, over all, and judgment will happen to everyone. But as you can read in Luke 21, th verses 35 through 36, it's gonna come as a snare to most people. Are we gonna be cut off guard? Are we gonna be ready? Are we gonna be found worthy? It'll come a snare on all those who dwell on the earth. Therefore, what should we do? Watch, watch world news, yes. But what are we really supposed to watch first and foremost? Watch therefore and pray always, always. Not just waiting till the end time events start to strike and then, well, I better get close to God now because it'll probably be too late for you by then. May count, be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. The, the Amplified Version puts 36 this way. But keep alert at all times. Be attentive and ready, praying that you may have strength and ability to be found worthy. You know, if you're, you're found something, you're already that. When Christ comes back, you better be found worthy before then. We've got to be preparing in advance. Otherwise, when he returns, we won't be ready. We'll be found sleeping. And that's not where we want to be. Found worthy to escape all these things. So there was a way of escaping to escape all these things and stand before the presence of the Son of Man at his coming. Christ promised there is a way of escape. We're going to be judged worthy of that or unworthy of that. Some of the church will go into the tribulation. A great multitude will come out of the great tribulation. Which side are you going to be on? Where will you be when God judges you worthy or unworthy? We want to make sure we're prepared now. The right side of history is important to be on. We need to watch most of all our spiritual condition. Think about Daniel the prophet. When he got into a trauma, a hard situation, did he run away from God? Did he drift away gradually? Or did he stay close to God? You know the story there in Daniel 6 about him being thrown in the lion's den. Well, you remember the story. I'll just summarize it here for you. King Darius had, had made him one of the three leaders of the land. And so he would 
continued to pray as he did from a young man three times a day, opening his windows toward Jerusalem, kneeling down and praying toward Jerusalem, as was told, God told Solomon that should be done at that time. And so he prayed, but he, they, he, was, or he was put up as a governor over all the land, and there were some 120 satraps that were leaders of the land. And of course, they became very jealous because Daniel distinguished himself above the others. He was in tune with God. He was living by God's way of life. He had the responsibility of the man in charge, and so he got promoted. And Daniel would be thrown into the lion's den because of what? He ran away from God? He drifted away from God? Or he was ready? Was he found ready? So these plotters got, got together with the king, and they said, you know, they tried to find something wrong with Daniel. There's got to be something we can accuse this guy of and get him in trouble. We don't like him to be over us. He's that young Jewish lad. Of course, by this time, he's a little older. And, and the Medes and the Persian had a rule that if anything that can, the king put into place, no one, not even the king, could rescind. And so they talked him into signing a petition. I'm sure in their political conniving and everything, they thought it was a pretty good way to trick the king. They said, we should write a petition, king, that nobody can worship or entreat or petition any god or any man except for you. You're the sovereign one. O king, live forever. And so that's what they did. Darius signed it, sent it out. For 30 days, no one could worship, talk to, or petition any god or man. Then we'll pick up the story here in verse, six of Daniel, uh, verse 10 of Daniel 6. Now Daniel knew, now notice this, Daniel knew the writing was signed. What would you do? And you knew the consequences for bowing down and praying to God would be thrown into the lion's den. He wasn't going to run away from God. He wasn't going to hide. He was going to be on the right side of history, as we shall see. But Daniel knew that the writing was signed. And he went home, and in the upper room, with his windows open to, toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees and gave three times that day in prayer and thanks before God as was his custom from early on, from a young lad. He did that. He wasn't going to get away from God. He was going to get closer to God. And sure enough, the plotters saw through the window, and they reported them to the king, and the king had to put his signet ring on the door as Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Imagine they were pretty hungry by then. It was a trap which just most people obviously came out very, very dead very quickly. But Daniel had stayed there all night. And the next morning, the king comes, Oh, Daniel, are you still there? Are you there? Live forever, O king. Daniel was alive. God had sent an angel and shut the lion's mouths. So Daniel was, was brought out. The men who accused him were thrown down there with their families, and the lions were so ferociously hungry by this time that they gobbled up the flesh, broke the bones of everybody, and there wasn't much left. How's your judgment? Are you going to be the Daniel in the lion's dead or the evil ones who plot? and play politics and connive and try to get ahead in this world. That's the choice we have, brethren, and we need to make the former choice. Daniel was protected, and the evil, evil leaders were slain. Same is going to be true as we enter the end time, as we enter these events that will come to pass. Some will be on the right side and some won't. How will God judge you? So the righteous who turn to God in time of need, now and in the future, will be judged worthy to escape all these things. David had a traumatic life from time to time. You think about committing adultery with Bathsheba and the baby was born, the baby was sick, and the baby was about to die. Would you be mad at God? Would you think God was a bad judge? He wrote this right after that time, Daniel 9, or I should say Psalm 9, verses 8 through 10. Psalm 9, verses 8 through 10. Talking about God. He shall judge the world in righteousness. God's judgments are in righteousness. It's the best thing overall for humankind as God counts their worthiness. And he shall administer judgment, David said, for the people in righteousness. It was hard to lose a son, hard to lose a loved one, hard to lose friends in this world that are going to be slaughtered, many of them, in these end-time events. But God's judgment is righteous and upright. The Lord shall and also will be a refuge for the oppressed, some place we go for security and safety, some place we flee to, not away from, a refuge in time of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, O Lord, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. 
And that's the point. We need to seek God with all of our heart. Seek the Lord, it says in Isaiah, and he may be found. God is right there. God's right there. Call upon him while he is near before these events strike an unsuspecting world.